Hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to be back with you after a while. Um, my name's Mike Sams, if I haven't met you, and it's uh, great to be with you to open up this uh, passage from Luke that if you're following along, you might have thought, gee, that's quite challenging. And that's because it is. And we're going to spend some time today, um, as I'm going to pray in a moment, asking God to transform our hearts and minds and the way that we live. Uh, so let's, uh, let's pray and let's think about how we love together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come together uh, this morning, uh, this beautiful morning, and sit under your word. And as we hear about uh, how we love or who we love, uh, with it being so radically different to the world, we pray by your spirit we will be transformed. Amen. Now I want you to think about the people that you love. Why do you love them? How many of those people are people that you hate? It's not the natural way of thinking about love, is it? You see, the person that I love most in the world, my wife, Jen, and, well, I didn't go around looking for someone who really dislikes me and I dislike them and thought, that's the person I'm going to love and spend the rest of my life with. It doesn't work that way. She thought that I was okay and I thought she was brilliant. I thought this is someone who I could love for the rest of my days and so we got married and there was no intent to be enemies. Right? That's kind of the way it goes. But today Jesus is wanting to totally shift the paradigm for how Christians are to view those they love. If you're wondering why Christians uh, do strange things that seem so unwise or so weird, so strange, here's one of the things that Jesus said that transforms our way of thinking. So let's have a look at this passage in Luke 6 and consider what it means for how we live. So I think in this passage, it, it gets us thinking about a question that is often asked. The question of how do you treat those who you have a poor relationship with. Now, if you think of the, the, the world around us, what are often the answers to the question like that? Well, I think often the answer is, well, if someone's treating you badly, you just do you. Ignore them. Get on with what you want to do. They're toxic people. You don't want to have anything to do with toxic people. Get them out of your life. You just don't need the drama. Move on. Reject them. Even destroy them if they're going to get you. That is a picture of how the world often talks about those we have a poor relationship with. But Jesus in this passage today is so countercultural, so different. He see, says things that seem outrageous. Have a look with me at verse 27. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Love your enemies. I mean, that can't be possible. This, maybe this is one of those quaint things that Christians believe that Jesus says, but we don't really need to follow through with it, right? But no, Jesus actually meant it. And what's the context of this, this, the environment that Jesus was in as he was going around um, sharing this new way of living as he heads to the cross? Well, the context, context was is that people were being oppressed. There were different um, religious groups that didn't like each other. The Jews and the Gentiles, the Jews and the Samaritans, and even the Jewish leaders hated Jesus. We know that as we read the Gospels, how much they despised him. And they couldn't understand why you would love a wicked person. If we flick back um, just into chapter 5, we see Jesus calls Levi the tax collector. A Jew who's doing the work of the Romans, you've got to hate him. And what does Jesus do? He calls him to follow him and goes and eats at his house, an act of love. And they're thinking, why are you loving this guy? This is not a be nice if you can love your enemies, or do it if it's not going to cost you anything. This is a totally radical way of thinking. 
This is not a <clears throat> just throw a coin uh, to someone as you pass by or say sorry that you feel that way if someone's offended and then move on as if the incident never happened. This is deep, profound change in how we think about those we're out of relationship with. See, in that passage, after love your enemies, you see what it says? Do good, not to those who you like, do good to those who hate you. Those who actually want bad things to happen for you, who are hoping that your life isn't full of good, isn't full of joy, isn't full of happiness, what should you, how should you think about them? What's the first word in verse 28? Bless those who curse you. And then you get, pray for those who mistreat you. It's an extraordinary thing and it's a very helpful just application that when you're ever struggling in this space. I remember the first time someone told me this. I've heard it many different times. If you think of the person you're, you are struggling with the most, the person that you're out of relationship, the person who you foster bitterness towards, and then every day pray for them. What are you going to pray? Dear God, please help, help me to foster my bitterness. Please help me to destroy them. You're not going to do that because that's not what prayer is. It changes our mindset. And Jesus is saying, pray for those who mistreat you. How does this passage make you feel? I think for all of us, there'll be all sorts of different emotions as we're wrestling with people that we struggle with. And what do you, how do you feel? It's, yeah, it's good, but what about this scenario? Or are you torn? I kind of get it, but it's unrealistic. Or it's just annoying. I don't want to have to do that. Or can you, as a kind of good Christian, assent to this idea, but live your life as sometimes maybe all of us do at some point, put our blinkers on to where we really struggle to apply this? You see, the challenge is clear, isn't it? Jesus is saying your attitude to those you're out of relationship with needs a radical overhaul as one of my followers. And the question is, are you up to it? See, as we continue on in this passage, we, we look at examples that paint a picture and challenge the way that we think about it. Have a look at verse 29. If sl someone slaps you on the cheek, pick up your hand and slap them back. No. Turn to them the other also. Last night I went to the movies, one of my teenagers, and they, they chose the movie, and I was glad the movie they chose because it's the one I wanted as well. We went and saw the Batman. Now, there's been so many Batman movies, you can't keep count, right? Some are brilliant, some are tragic. But this movie, at, at the beginning, someone says to Batman, who are you? And, you know, Batman's all brooding and deep, and he's kind of growly voice. He says, I am vengeance. And I had this passage swirling in and around in my head, and I just thought, that's it, isn't it? And I think about all the movies that I love and all the way we talk in society and whether, you, whether it's some kind of... Um, comic movie or whether it's westerns of the days old I used to watch with my dad and every movie in between it's about getting back at those that do you wrong it wouldn't be as good a movie if Batman said I am the one who's going to love that person it's going to be a very good movie well likely but it's not the way to live I'm not going to do to you what you're doing to me there's the shift in thinking and it continues on. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. If someone steals from you, call the police. Get, get your shirt back. Steal, back. steal it back from them. No, this bizarre way of loving your enemies is overwhelmingly, shockingly generous. We are taking the kid's spot from today and ramping it up a level. Or rather, Jesus is because he's not just talking about your friends. He's talking about your enemies and the mindset of generosity. We're supposed to be sitting here feeling a little bit uncomfortable. And so we get to verse 30 and it's just really simply, give to everyone who asks you. That is, there are no boundaries. There are no, I would just give to, to Bob because he's a friend 
But I'm not giving anything to Tony because I knew him five years ago and he did this to me and I'm still fostering a bit of bitterness towards that and so, sorry, I cannot engage. There are no boundaries with this kind of love. And he goes on, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, you get it back. You, you get what is yours. No, it says, do not demand it back. See, loving your enemies is not about one of the most important words in my household, which I wish it wasn't. It's not fair. Fairness. It's not about that. Have you you ever said as a kid, have you ever had your kids say, it's not fair, as if fairness is the be all and end all at every single moment and and fairness is even distorted anyway? Sometimes what can be seen to be just... Uh, just and right to demand something is not the way it should play out. Fairness is not the be-all and end-all with this loving your enemies. And then we get what's often known as the golden rule. Verse 31. Do to others as you would have them do to you. That is... I think we were made by God in his image to want to be loved, to be loved. And so as we think about how we want to be loved, that is the mindset that we have to others regardless of whether they are loving us. This shapes how you see others. And it does seem extreme, doesn't it? It does seem so countercultural. If you've never, if you if you don't follow Jesus and you're wondering what, what is it all about, this just seems so far left of field. And I think, unless we understand more about Jesus and what He's saying, it does kind of seem out of reach. You see, what Jesus is showing us is a revolutionary way to live that is so countercultural. Vengeance should be far from the heart. Fostering bitterness does not seem to be the right way. Getting back at others is not the way forward. Choosing not to love others is inappropriate. Destroying our enemies is unacceptable. We are not only being shown a whole new way to approach people, that we are out of step with. But we're also being shown that we do that because we have different motives. And it's not about us. So I think that's what we see in the next uh, part of the passage, in that from verse 32 to 35, I want to read it to you, and I want to see if, if you can pick up with me the phrase, it's actually a question, that is repeated three times. Verse 32, If you love those who love you, What credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But, we come back full circle, love your enemies, do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. What was the question asked three times? What credit is that to you? You do this thing that is good, but it's not like you're the best person in the world. Wow, Michael, you wash the dishes because you love Jen. What credit is that to you? That's so impressive. How great are you? I don't think that's that impressive, really. Sometimes I may go for a bit of you know, dadulation and try and get praise for things I do, but it's not the right way. You see, what we're seeing here is that even those that have done wrong, even those that are, are wicked, have people that love them. Now, what do you find in, in every single jail, pretty much? you'll find a visitor centre. Why? Because often people who have done the most heinous of crimes have people that they love and who love them who want to come and visit them. 
We are going beyond just loving our inner bubble. We are pushing beyond that to see that God wants us to have totally different motives. We love the way God wants us to love. But it's more than that. We love the way he loves. And the way he loves is really the way that he loves us. See, verse 36 sums it up. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Now, that's extraordinary, isn't it? We are to be merciful because God is merciful. And as we thought, we reflected on those illustrations and those descriptions, we are getting a picture of Jesus who loves like that, who goes to the cross. Consider Jesus. Because when Jesus went to the cross, what was our relationship towards him? It wasn't too good, was it? I love Romans 5, how it highlights this this contrast and it really this passage just threw me there with what what we see in Romans 5 in verses 6 to 11 see in, in, in verse 6 we read Christ died for the ungodly that makes it clear enough he died for us not when we were godly he died for us when we were out of relationship with him and then in verse 8 he shows us his love he demonstrates his love for us and what does it say while we were still sinners Christ died for us you know, just previously in, 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 um, in Luke 6, we see even the sinners, how people love them. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. But this passage which describes how Jesus saves us and what he does. We get to verse 10 and we read very clearly. There is no argument. For while we were God's enemies... We were reconciled to him through the death of his son. We were God's enemies when he went to the cross. We were out of relationship with him. He sacrificed everything for you and I because of our rebellion, whatever that looks like. The Lord of all, who made all things, through whom all things were, were created, all things for him, comes down, sees our wickedness and goes, I'm going to destroy them. No. While we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him. Christ died for the ungodly. And this death, in, in Romans 5, the point that Paul's trying to drive home here is that your reconciliation with God, your salvation is sure. Having been reconciled, in verse, uh, in verse 10 it goes on to say, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? We are given life. We go from being an enemy to being in perfect relationship with the one we hated on. And the thing that changed was that he took our punishment. That is a massive paradigm shift. It's the thing that starts to make sense of what Jesus is saying before he heads to the cross when he says, love your enemies. I'm going to show you how to love your enemies by making it possible by loving you first. How marvellous is this picture? And as followers of Jesus, we're challenged to walk in in this way so as we consider this I want to suggest to you as we love those who don't love us it's hard and we stumble all the time this side of heaven we're not that good at it loving all the time do you do you think that's the case or do you think you've got this sorted because I want to suggest to you not only that we find it hard, I think we all find it hard maybe in three different points we can stumble. Sometimes we stumble in the head. You're not convinced. You don't think that in your mind this is the right way. You don't really believe it. But secondly, we can kind of believe it in our head, see what Jesus has done, 
but it hasn't pierced our heart and hasn't and so we we're not really acting on it and so then thirdly we can sometimes think that we have got it in our head in our heart but what have we got to show the change and i want to suggest to you today to wrestle with where you are in that and when do you find that difficult you see, in your mind, do you believe God did this for you and you should walk in his footsteps? See, it doesn't make as much sense without the love of God for you, does it? Do you believe what he has done for you, that he has loved you when you were his enemies and you can have a relationship with him? That's the first thing, right? It could be that that's what you need to turn today to him, trust in him and have life forever. But does your belief in that shape how you treat others? Can you go home today and say, I am convicted of this. It is what sets me apart from my friends who, who think very differently. That can be a challenge for us sometimes, just to believe it. And I think we're being called today to bring that before God and ask him to change our minds. But it's not just an intellectual thing, is it? Like everything we saw was more than that in this passage. Where is your heart? Is your heart prepared for what this could look like? Now, it's been a long time since I went to school, granted, right? But there was a group of friends of us of about 20 or so, 15, 20 or so, and there was a massive falling out. And a few of them did some just totally tore me to shreds. And for years and years after being at school, I fostered bitterness. I fostered hatred to them. Didn't get to act it out on it really because we moved on. But I'm certain that I wouldn't have been friendly towards them. I think... This passage today and Jesus is exposing that in us. How would you talk? How do you talk about all other people that are different to you in whatever way? That can expose our heart. We can convince ourselves, and most of the time we've got it right, and then other times, oh, hang on a minute. I do have these prejudices. I don't like this group of people. I don't like them. I don't want to help them. But I do love people, and I do want to love my enemies. We, we live in this conflicted way, don't we? You see, there is a difference between intellectual assent and heart transformation. Have you made this transformation or are you in denial? What are you fostering in your heart? Where do you need to excise the bitterness? Is there someone that you would love to see destroyed? Is your heart prepared for what this could look like. And then lastly, it's not just a head and heart exercise and that's it. They spill out into the way that we live, what we do with our hands, our actions. Are you going to live it out? See, the passage here today we see is all about action. And as we think about what Jesus has done, we don't get this amazing, you know, page after page, page philosophical argument about how God loves us and what it is, we see Jesus on the cross in our place. The most extraordinary, perfect act that was ever given. It is possible to think you have understood it. It is possible to think your heart has been transformed, but there is no actual change because sometimes we live in that space, don't we? And we can, if we um, look at it, we can be conflicted. Can you describe what's different? I think I can say in good conscience those friends at school now, after many years, I could relate to them in a totally different way than what I could when in my, say, late 20s, early 30s. But I reckon there's maybe other parts of my life that I need to think about. And what about you? What's the last 12 months been like for you? Did you just care for people in COVID and the whole this time that care for you? What conflict have you had and how have you loved in that conflict or have you just been on about getting fairness or justice or destroying the other? What about at work? Now, often at work we're, we're pitted up against each other 
And the whole idea of loving someone is that they actually want to create this sense of that's your enemy because either they get the promotion or you get the promotion or the job gets succeeded, they get the, the, the credit for it or you get the credit for it. And so you're tempted to tear someone down. Where are your actions? What's going to happen in the next month? Where does your mind and heart and your hands need transformation? There are going to be times ahead where you should pray that these words from Jesus come to the front of your mind and shape how you act. Whether it's at work, whether it's somewhere in the community, whether it's dealing with um, relationships. I want to suggest to you, those of us in Christ need to continually commit to this transformation. So that's what I'm going to pray to finish now. Heavenly Father, we hear the words of Jesus, love your enemies, and on the surface it just seems ridiculously strange. But then we cast our eyes to your mercy and we see Jesus on the cross while we are enemies and it becomes all clearer that you are wanting a radical transformation in our life as, as you have saved us by Jesus. And so we pray now that all of us can, in Christ, continue day by day to be transformed, to love those who aren't loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.